Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are excited to be joined by Distinguished Professor of Sociology, Jane Mencken, this evening. A quick note about the Zoom settings for tonight's event. All attendee lines will be muted throughout the lecture. To submit questions or to seek technical support, please send your questions and comments to the chat box. We may not have time to get to all of your questions, so please uh, but we'll certainly do our best to address the themes and ideas that are most common. In addition, closed captioning is enabled for this event. Please click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen to enable or disable this feature. Finally, this lecture will be recorded and posted on the association's website at www.colorado.edu slash retired faculty. And now please welcome Dave Kasoy, Chair of the Retired Faculty Association. Uh, good evening. I'm pleased uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Myron Gutman, uh, Professor of History and Director of the Institute for Behavioral Sciences, an interdisciplinary unit that was created in the 50s by uh, a variety of, of people, including Dick Jesser. Uh, Professor Gutman, it's yours. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, good evening. I'm Myron Gutman. Uh, I'm director of the Institute of Behavioral Science, and it's my inane, amazing pleasure to introduce my colleague and our speaker tonight, Jane Mencken, who is a distinguished professor at CU, one of the world's leading demographers. Uh, let me remind you the earlier message for the Q&A. Uh, please put your questions in the Zoom chat, and I'll pass them on to Jane after she's finished her presentation. I could take our whole time this evening telling you about Jane's many accomplishments, but I don't want to take away any more time than absolutely necessary from her talk. So I'll limit myself to a few words. Jane Mencken was trained at the University of Pennsylvania in mathematics, at Harvard in biostatistics, and at Princeton in demography, where she received her PhD. Since then, she has been a faculty member at Princeton, at the University of Pennsylvania, and here at the University of Colorado since 1997. From 1997 until 2015, she was a professor in the Department of Sociology. And from 2001 to 2015, she was my predecessor as director of the Institute of Behavioral Science. And she's a tough act to follow. I don't have time to mention all of her many hours, honors, but here are a few. She's an elected member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the Academy of Medicine. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's won virtually all of the awards offered by the United States and International Associations for Demographic Researchers. Too many to mention, but pretty much anything you can imagine. She's also been president of the Population Association of America and a leader in a multitude of other scientific organizations in the US and around the world. The best part of talking about Jane's career is the opportunity to mention where her research has led to important discoveries. She's been known for decades for her groundbreaking work in the mathematics of demography and the relationships between that mathematics and the biological processes that are fundamental to life and death. To that, she has added fundamental work on the ways that demographic change is tied to societal change, as exemplified by her long and productive work in Bangladesh, a part of which you'll learn about today. In the midst of all that, there are dozens of influential publications about a whole range of demographic and societal topics. Jane's scientific influence is equaled by her extraordinary record as a teacher and mentor providing guidance, instruction, and leadership by example to teams of researchers for the past five decades. We see the confluence of her research leadership and her mentoring in the two projects, the two big group projects that she describes in her talk today. Jane, thank you for everything you've done for our field, for our colleagues, for the Institute, and for the University of Colorado. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, Myron. And thank you, David and Kai Young and the Retired Faculty Association. I'm honored to be here tonight to be given the opportunity to talk to people at home, the retired faculty at CU Boulder, colleagues and students and family and friends, and all who are interested in the research 
that has been and is being carried out at this great university in this great state. As Myron mentioned, I came to Boulder 24 years ago to join my husband, Dick Jesser, who is just now retiring fully after 70 years as a CU Boulder professor, a tenure that I assume is a record. The main academic attractor was and is the Institute of Behavioral Science and the social science departments that it is associated with. I have the great privilege to work with wonderful colleagues and students and staff. As, my, as was mentioned earlier, IBS was founded in 1957 as a place to foster interdisciplinary research on issues of societal importance. Dick was one of its founders. The issue I've been most involved in is population, specifically the causes and consequences of population change. As most of us know, the world changed just a few centuries ago when death rates declined while birth rates remained at high levels. That difference, when the number of births in a year far exceeded the number of deaths, led to population growth and the current nearly 8 billion people on the planet. Concern about population growth goes back even before Malthus, who in the late 18th century argued that population tending to grow at a geometric rate will ever press against the food supply, which at best increases only arithmetically, and thus poverty and misery are forever inescapable. He wasn't a happy man. By mid 20th century, the, this growth was referred to as the population explosion or even the population bomb and generated great concern. Stanford biology professor Paul Ehrlich published his alarmist treatise in 1968. Population growth can slow in only two ways, by increasing deaths or by decreasing births. The effects of deaths of despair and COVID-19 on population growth are a topic for another evening, but clearly no one wants to see increased deaths. So focus turn to decreasing fertility as a means of slowing population growth and reducing the possibility of all the dire consequences for the planet that were predicted if growth were to continue. Most industrialized countries by the middle of the last century had already greatly reduced their fertility. By the time Ehrlich published his book, the US had gone past the baby boom and fertility in 1968 was down to 2.5 births per woman in her lifetime, in line with the long decline in our country. The methods people use to control their fertility are again a topic for another talk. But today I wanna to talk about the role of intervention programs, of family planning programs in fostering fertility decline and fertility control. Two types of activist groups came together in the middle of the 20th century to advocate for increasing support for family planning programs. Those desiring to reduce population growth for the good of the world, those who believed that control of women's fertility was good for women, children, and families. By the end of the 20th century, the position increasingly shifted to advocating for the individual, advocating to increase the ability of women and couples to control their own fertility and have the number of children they wanted. Many claim that fertility reduction itself would have positive effects, that it would promote social and economic development, better health, and better human capital formation, and that reducing population gro growth, excuse me, would enable countries to catch up sooner in provision of things like healthcare and education. Gary Becker won the Nobel, Pro Nobel Prize in economics in part because of his theories about the family and the theory of quantity quality trade-off, that people could have fewer and I put this in quotes, higher quality children. So the benefits of reduced fertility were proposed both at the macro level and at the individual level. This kind of thinking led to population programs being instituted around the world and to developing country, developed countries 
offering aid to low and middle income countries for these programs. But two questions remain. Can family planning programs actually promote the kind of fertility decline needed to stop population growth? In other words, do the programs work? Or is any fertility decline really due to general social and economic development? Things like empowerment of women through increased schooling and their labor force particip participation, declining child mortality, and the rising cost of rear rearing children. I wanna now stop for a minute and think about what's needed to stop population growth. There's a lot of mathematical demography, something called stable population theory that backs up what I'm about to say, but it's really a simple con concept. I hope I can convince you it's simple. If we don't want population to grow, that means that women need to have two children on average, one to replace the woman herself and a male partner plus a little more to replace girls who did not survive long enough to have their own children. So the magic number is about 2.1. If lifetime fertility is greater than 2.1, population grows. If it's below 2.1, it ultimately declines in size, something that's already happening in a number of countries, including Japan in, the, in our world today. If it's 2.1, the population eventually becomes constant, neither growing nor declining. That's true if a woman has her two children when she's 15 and 17, or 40 and 42, or any other combination you choose. Turning to the second part, is there evidence of indirect effects? So to restate my questions, can programs and policies cause greater contraceptive use and therefore reduce fertility? And can access to the means of controlling fertility itself lead to positive outcomes, especially those good for women and men and their children? Not surprisingly, there are lots of assumptions and lots of conviction that we know the answers but there are very few scientific evaluations of these questions. Why, why are there so few evaluations? The answer is it's really hard to meet the criteria for a scientifically defensible evaluation. I've listed those that I consider essential here. The first is that there has to be an abrupt initiation of an intervention. So there's a before, and after. And there has to be a true comparison group, one that was previously similar to the intervention group and did not receive the intervention. Both have to be of sufficiently large uh, sample size so that you can really see uh, outcomes. And both the intervention and the comparison groups need to be followed over a relatively long time if you're asking does lower fertility increase education of children, you have to wait till those kids are uh, of an age to go to school. And you have to have low attrition rates. You can't lose people. That can totally bias your results. And data need to be collected on the relevant later events and outcomes. So, Given that, today I'm going to talk about two programs that promoted access to family planning and two evaluations spearheaded here at CU that tell us a lot about the role of programs, interventions, if you will, in promoting the ability of people to control their own fertility and in causing later effects on people's lives. The first intervention took place in a situation of great poverty and very high fertility. And the second in, in the low fertility context of the contemporary US. The first evaluation, the first evaluates the impact of a maternal and child health and family planning program in rural Bangladesh, asking whether introducing a program in a poor, rural, mostly illiterate population 
enabled people, women and couples, to reduce their fertility, and then whether there were additional benefits. So we'll travel halfway around the world. But then we'll end up here at home, looking at the Colorado Family Planning Initiative, which beginning in 2009, expanded access to all methods of contraception. Here we ask whether expanding access in an existing program has benefits. So let's go to Bangladesh. After World War II, India was partitioned into predominantly Muslim Pakistan and current day predominantly Hindu India. East Pakistan is the current Pakistan and West Pakistan, the current Bangladesh. We're a single country, as you can see, separated by a thousand miles of India. Not surprisingly, the situation didn't work. And after a bloody civil war in 1971, East Pakistan became Bangladesh. The International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, and I've heard every joke about that name, uh, which now goes by just its initials, ICDDRB, instituted a maternal and child health and family planning program in a rural area. It was set up as a true experiment with intervention and comparison areas that were similar before the program began. It was also set up in an area where data were collected regularly so that the impact of the program could be tracked over time. The program was a partnership with the Bangladesh government. So it served as a pilot program for improving the government of Bangladesh's own program. Henry Kissinger famously referred to Bangladesh at its independence as the basket case of the world. Some of us here today are old enough to remember the concert for Bangladesh, the George Harrison of Beatles fame and Ravi Shankar, the famed Indian sitar musician arranged in Madison Square Garden in the summer of 1971. Around that time, Bangladesh had 64 million people crowded into a country the size of Wisconsin. And in 2020, Wisconsin's population was only 5.8 million. Bangladesh had high mortal uh, mortality. Life expectancy was only 47 years and over 14% of infants died before their first birthday. At the same time, life expectancy in the US was 70 years. And our great good fortune was that only 1.3% of our babies died. But Bangladesh has many things going for it. These photos are from one of my first trips to a research trip to Bangladesh in 1984. The rivers are beautiful, even though they're prone to serious periodic flooding. Boats are a very common form of travel. There's fertile soil for agriculture, but getting to rural villages often involved crossing my favorite bamboo bridges. My friend and colleague, Omar Rahman is crossing, he's a city person and he's crossing the bridge the way I do, very carefully. Another friend, Abbas Buya is in the back. Abbas is village born and he talks about carrying his bicycle over this kind of bridge so he could ride to school on the other side. Another friend, Stan Foster, headed the smallpox uh, eradication campaign in Bangladesh. And Stan says, you don't know how, he's a big guy. And he says, you don't know how many of those bridges I broke. Houses in the villages are clustered in what are called baris, usually thought to be made up of related families. Women observed porta, seclusion, and rarely ventured outside their own baris. This one is a quite wealthy bari. You can tell there's a house with tin walls and tin, tin roof. In this context, as I mentioned, ICDDRB was established in the early 1960s. Its goal was to develop a vaccine against cholera. It set up a research station in a rural area 
with high cholera rates. Matlab, indicated by the blue dot on the map, is about 55 kilometers southeast of Dhaka. I, in early, around 1980, 55 kilometers, it took over four hours, and that was a minimum to get there. Because it needed to track cholera cases and cholera rates, ICDDRB set up what is now the Matlab Health and Demographic Surveillance System in 1966. Data on who was in the household, on births and on deaths, were collected every few months in the geographic area that held a population of about 200,000 people. Crucial to our story today, ICDDRB set up an intervention, the Maternal and Child Health and Family Planning Program, in late 90, 1977, in about half the area. Much less extensive government services were provided in the comparison area. As lessons learned from the ICDDRB were transferred to the national program, services in the comparison area improved over time. And here the intervention area is in pink, the comparison area is in groups and the divisions are villages. The program was set up so that women could continue to observe Porta. Local women were trained to deliver services in the home. So what happened? Data from the Matlab Health and Demographic Surveillance System tells us part of the story. What had previously been the same changed. The treatment, the intervention area experienced a sooner and larger drop in fertility. But over time, as services and culture changed, the comparison area caught up. Similar story for um, uh, under five mortality. That big peak you see um, in the early 1980s was a huge measles epidemic that swept through Bangladesh. But additional needed data were needed to find out what happened to families and children. And this is where my colleagues and I came in. We carried out large scale surveys in Matlab in 1996, and then a follow-up of the same people and their families beginning in 2012, some 35 years after the original intervention. Here's what it's like to do a survey in uh, Bangladesh in 1996. One of our interviewers, people who think about privacy, confidentiality, you're supposed to, no way. We had supervisors all over volunteering to help us in every way possible. And here they are measuring adult height and measuring child weight for the surveys. So what happened? Here we could look at a group of women born 1950 to 1961 women who were in early stages of their reproductive careers at the start of the program. They were 17 to 28. Most of them already had at least one child. Childbearing started very early, marriage 14 or 15 followed as soon as possible by that first child to demonstrate that the uh, marriage could be a fertile one. So what we see is that, um, Children in the intervention area in orange had fewer children, but in part because of having fewer children and having a health, a child health program, more of those children survived. So that the number of children reaching age 18 is almost identical. And the children with 10 years of plus of schooling children you might think better able to take care of their parents in old age. Uh, that number was almost the same with the, the intervention area having slightly uh, higher percentage of children with um, uh, high school education or entering high school. We then looked at children born in the decade after the program began 
And our long-term follow-up shows that kids born in the intervention area had some 30 plus years later, they increased survival into adulthood. They did have more education. They were taller. They had had better nutrition and fewer health insults as children. And the men had better jobs. Fewer of them were manual lab laborers and more had jobs that involved math and writing. Among the women, the effects carried over to the next generation, to the granddaughters. The daughters of, of these women I'm talking about were measured when they were ages zero to 10 in our survey, our later survey. And these girls were taller and they were less likely to be stunted, to be short because of poor nutrition and poor health in childhood. So the granddaughters were better off. We don't see as any effect for the sons. So what happened to the original women, the ones who, were, who participated in the intervention at the start? There, wasn't no, there was no effect on their survival. The programs that were put into effect did not differ enough behind, between the areas and the original programs really were targeted at children. They may have been targeted at the time around um, childbirth, but this did not lead to improved survival for the women. We did find a surprising negative effect. The women in the um, um, intervention group had slightly poorer overall health possibly because they had a lot of weight gain. Um, they seem to have been better off, able to get more food, and they ate it. Uh, the women in the inter intervention group were fully 10 percentage points higher in being overweight or obese, 42% compared to the 32% in the comparison area. But these effects were relatively minor. Much more important are the positive effects of improving the ability of women and couples to control their fertility as they chose. But the, the findings also illustrate the need for any intervention evaluation to consider unanticipated outcomes, the surprising effects and even negative effects. But what happened to Bangladesh overall? For the country, Family planning was near universally accepted. By 2020, Bangladesh actually had reached replacement fertility, having gone from 6.6 .6 children per woman in 1978 to 2.0 in 2020. At the same time, it was investing in family planning. Bangladesh was investing in education with emphasis on girls' education. And this was made easier because the education system did not have to expand as rapidly as would have been needed if fertility had remained high and there were more girls and boys to educate. So the so-called basket case had turned into an economic growth powerhouse. Life expectancy had increased by 25 years and is now 72 years. Infant mortality plummeted to 2.6% of children dying before their first birthday. Measles Im immunization, DPT immuniz immunization, all the childhood immuniz immunizations are near universal as is primary schooling. GDP per, per capita, Look at that, $140 per person in 1970, up to almost $1,700 in 2019. Just wanna add that if the 1970 population growth rate of 2.4% had persisted, the 2019 population would have been 209 million. Instead, Bangladesh reduced its fertility and its population is 163 million. But still think of it, it's the most densely populated non-island country 
uh, in the world. Nick Kristof, writing in the New York Times in, in, in 1961, said that Bangladesh was bountiful primarily in misfortune. But he's changed his tune. In a March article in the New York Times, he recommended that President Biden look to Bangladesh for ideas on what to do about poverty. He advised looking to education and girls. He doesn't mention family planning. And I'd love to convince him that reduction of population growth through family planning played a supporting role. I want to leave this slide of our team, whom I thank with all my heart, while I talk about what we have learned with this in-depth analysis of an intervention in Bangladesh. We've learned, or at least I think we've learned, uh, well-designed programs can hasten fertility decline in low-income settings. They can have positive long-term impacts that may only be discernible if there are well-designed evaluations. And it's important to evaluate what works, not just assume that effects will work out as predicted. Comparison with Pakistan is, excuse me, is illuminating. In 1970, fertility rates were near identical, 6.95 in Bangladesh, slightly lower in Pakistan at 6.6. .6. But Pakistan did not institute the kinds of programs, family planning and education, emphasizing girls that we've seen in Bangladesh. In 2019, the fertility difference was huge, huge. Women in Pakistan had fertility of 3.5, one and a half more children than Bangladesh's 2.0. We can't say that family planning alone caused, caused Bangladesh's positive development story, but the MATLAB study shows that a family planning program led to earlier adoption of contraception and smaller family size. End of that story. So now let's turn to the US and Colorado. The US, as we all know, has already achieved low levels of fertility, even below replacement. Do we really need more family planning? Much of the support for family planning in the US rests on decades of scholarship that demonstrates that fertility is related to subsequent life course outcomes. For example, studies have shown that women who have teen births were less likely to graduate from high school than those who had their first birth later. But it turns out, not surprisingly, that socioeconomically disadvantaged kids were more likely to have teen births and more also, whether or not they had a teen birth, more likely to not graduate high school. The US has relatively high rates of teenage childbearing and unintended childbearing is highly prevalent between the ages of 18 and 24. So the question is, if these kids had greater access to the means of controlling fertility, would, would they be better off later? Again, this kind of causation is extremely difficult to identify. To do so is important because many public programs are designed to improve access to contraception and are justified on the basis of their long-term benefits. The story goes, if you help girls prevent a pregnancy in high school, you're helping to prevent uh, women who need aid later on in life. But it's also important to recognize for the, for the US, we're concerned more with this timing of children since the overall number of children women have is low. But if they have them sooner than they prefer, does it cut off opportunity? Think about it. If a woman wants to have two children or even three, she doesn't have to have the first one as a teenager to achieve that goal. And does postponing childbearing provide opportunity, say for higher education and for less poverty? It's well established that income is related to education. You can see where those with less than a high school diploma are on this graph. 
It's also well established that life expectancy is related to education. Simply put, the more education you have, the longer on average you live. And the difference is increasing between those with a BA or more and those without a BA. So a group of us at CU and the US Census Bureau decided to take advantage of a natural experiment afforded by the Colorado Family Planning Initiative. My colleagues are Amanda Stevenson, Steph Mulborn uh, at CU Boulder, Katie Genetic at the Census Bureau and IBS, Sarah Yateman at CU Denver. And I mention here the assistance of our uh, data scientist, Josh Sanders. So we decided to take this advantage of the CFPI intervention to estimate population level effects of expanded access, not new access, expanded access to contraception on women's on time high school and college completion. So what is CFPI? An anonymous private foundation granted Colorado some $27 million to improve low or no cost access to the full range of contraceptive methods statewide at all Colorado Title X family planning clinics beginning in 2009. CFPI provided the funding for contraception, for training of providers, for social marketing and support and advertising to ensure that all Title X family planning clients in Colorado could choose any FDA approved method of contraception at low or no cost. No comparable program was initiated in any other US state at the time. As a reminder, Title X is a federal program that funds access to sexual and reproductive health services for low income and uninsured residents and at least in Colorado, a lot of adolescents. Prior to CFPI funding, clinics could not afford to offer the most expensive methods to all who wanted to use them. The peak period of CFPI from 2010 to 2014 saw a dr dramatic increase in the use of long acting reversible contraceptives, uh, so-called LARCs like IUDs and implants and an equally dramatic reduction in birth rates for 20 to 24 four year olds compared to prevailing trends and other states. The blue line um, uh, uh, shows control states. The top orange line shows what, what was expected to be Colorado's path without the program and the lower line, the dramatic lowering of Colorado fertility. Equally dramatic was the decline in abortion rates for 15 to 24 year olds. Uh, but yet the broader effects on women's lives are not, were largely unknown. So the group of us here at CU and the Census Bureau decided to investigate the possible broader effects of this increased access. We were able to estimate the effect of the program using individual level longitudinally linked data from the full 2000 and 2010 US censuses and the 2006 to 2019 annual American community surveys. We were able to do so because CU successfully competed in a Census Bureau program and was able to establish the Rocky Mountain Research Data Center now housed within IBS and which provides access to restricted anonymized data. Our first paper on impacts on high school graduation was just published. We're pleased that the journal Science Advances chose it to be first in their index for that, at that edition and advertised it on the banner of the online version of the journal. Before I go on to our study design, I wanna note that um, beyond the fertility pathway, 
there are other potential pathways through which access to contraception may shape high school and college completion. Researchers have hypothesized that the opportunity to plan one's own childbearing in a reliable way may increase educational attainment through a number of possible mechanisms. It could expand a young woman's confidence that her investments in education will come to fruition, could improve her mental health, it could result in changes in education and labor mar market systems driven by reduced concern that young women's education and work lives will be cur curtailed because they suddenly had a baby. Turning to our study design, we use these restricted anonymized and <laughs> Uh, anonymized data, I, I always fall over that word, um, construct a woman's educational record. We did this for a group of women who were just too old to have their uh, high school career affected by CFPI interventions. The pre-CFPI cohort was born 1989 to 1991, and they were 18 to 20 when the initiative started. The post-CFPI cohort are girls who could have accessed family planning while they were in high school. They were born 1994 to 1996 and were 13 to 15 in 2009. We selected comparison states that did not experience this shift in access. We have two comparison groups what we refer to as parallel trend states and all other states. We got the data on residence and education achievement from the census and these American community surveys. Our comparison states were selected because their trend of increase in education uh, of in high school completion was similar to Colorado's, but we also compared Colorado to the rest of the US. So what's the answer to the question, did greater access to contraception make a difference in women's lives? Considering high school graduation, the answer is a resounding yes. The percent of women who achieved high school completion increased more in our state than in all these other states. The only thing that changed between Colorado and the other states was the abrupt introduction of an expanded family planning program, expanded family planning access. More important, we think, is that the percent who did not receive a high school diploma declined. And some 14% of the decline for all women was due to, we can attribute to CFPI. We also saw, were able, there were enough women to analyze white women, non-Hispanic white women and Hispanic women separately. We couldn't analyze other racial ethnic groups. The change for white women was an almost 28% decline and for Hispanic women, 22%. So many fewer girls failed to graduate from high school. And we believe that is attributable. These proportions, the, the, the areas shown in orange on the graph was attributable to CFPI. We're following the same kind of analytic strategy, and this is the first time this is, the graph is being presented to a general group. And what we can see here is that the increase in achievement of a BA was greater in Colorado than in our comparison groups. So, what have we learned? Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in a, in a 2007 dissent quoted from an earlier case that had become, come before the court in 1992. 
She wrote that women's ability to achieve their, to realize their full potential is intimately connected to their ability to control their reproductive lives. This study, one that shows that women's increasing ability to control their reproductive lives indeed led to greater realization of their potential. If you consider graduating from high school or college, um, increase a greater realization of their potential, provides solid evidence to back up Justice Ginsburg's statement. We, have, we may all have thought the statement was true, but now we know it is. Perhaps the best thing about both the Bangladesh and Colorado studies is that they, they measure the effect of something that governments can eth ethically do, make it easier for people to make their own reproductive choices. We firmly believe that governments cannot and should not tell people when and whether to have children, but they can empower people to make those decisions for themselves. We find that when family planning programs gave people more reproductive choices and, and health choices, Bangladeshi, Bangladeshis chose to have fewer and healthier children and Coloradan young women were more likely to graduate high school and college. Perhaps the final lesson learned is that it is necessary and, and feasible to evaluate fully at least some of the inter interventions intended to help people improve their lives so that policy for the future can have a full evidentiary base. The availability of scientific evidence about intervention programs to, to control fertility makes it possible for governments to adopt policies that strengthen families and, as Justice Ginsburg said, for women to realize their full potential. Thank you. Jane, thank you very much. This is really fabulous um, and, and a, a fabulous representation of the work that you've been part of. Um, what's, what's remarkable, um, as I said earlier, is how much this work is a reflection of teams working together and substantial teams working together to really accomplish uh, important and innovative things. So you've so overwhelmed our audience that nobody put any questions in the chat yet, uh, but that won't um, uh, that that won't um, that won't res uh, keep me from asking a question. Um, and it's really about the long history of uh, which you know you've been part of um, as long as anyone um, in in this group. Um, in the history of, of understanding population change and understanding of the change in women's lives. And, and one of the things that occurred to me to ask you is, how do you think this may, the, the results you're describing match up with the original intentions, especially of the people at, you know, at the origin of the policies in Bangladesh. You know, um, what, one of the full disclosures that Jane and I usually make is that uh, we started graduate school in demography at the same time, although she was already on her way to the National Academies and I was on my way to teach history classes. But um, it, was, it was that. But, but you know, it, the, the motivations for the people who, who were our classmates in demography and went off to work for the Population Council in the United Nations in fertility design programs, I, I, do, you, do you think they really ever saw, they saw at the beginning where this would lead in terms of the role of women's empowerment um, for economic and social change? Um, I think the people who were most influential in getting funding for family planning we're interested in the good of the world rather than the good of the women themselves. And, but by the time you and I were in graduate school and Myron is being way too modest about his accomplishments. Um, by that time, um, many of us had moved or were never in the uh, camp that was um, 
I, I refer to as men using women's bodies to uh, save the world. Um, I love the, uh, the guy who was head of AID who wanted to drop condoms by helicopter <laughs> over Brazil, uh, thinking that that would uh, work. Um, in Bangladesh, the program that was introduced was introduced by people who were sensitive to the culture. As I said, women mostly observed Porta. They didn't go outside their baris. So programs that said, okay, here's a clinic, come to it, uh, were never could have taken off the ground. And so they turned to home delivery, what's referred to as doorstep, doorstep delivery. There were no doorsteps, uh, for mostly openings um, uh, in households. And so they did believe that reducing fertility, giving people the choice to reduce their own fertility was a good thing in and of itself. Did they think it would really leave to, lead to women's empowerment? Some did, and their voices became stronger, and they became stronger by the late 1990s when the UN had population conference in Cairo in 1996, and those who were demanding reproductive rights were strong voices there. Excellent, great. I have a question from Lori P. Um, I know that it is your, about the Colorado research. I know that it has received a good deal of media attention. Do you have specific policy levers that you are hoping to pull here in Colorado or nationally based on these early and impactful findings? Uh, I hope so. And um, it's interesting that um, some of the candidates for specifically John Hickenlooper talked about the Colorado Family Planning Initiative in his uh, campaign as uh, positive support. I'm hoping that the, the funding from the foundation certainly has run out. Uh, the state has taken up some of the funding for the Colorado Family Planning Initiative. And I hope that we can work um, well with um, people and our group certainly is willing to do that. We believe that we aren't just scientists who put our work in journals and let it sit there. But if our findings have relevance to human life, we have a responsibility to work with others who are better than we and pushing the political levers to uh, um, create new and fund, continue to fund good programs. Great. A question from Marjorie McIntosh. If access to family planning leads to women having babies later in their lives, even if not fewer of them over the course of their fertile years, does that in turn contribute to lowered fertility? Is fertility lower for women in their 30s, let's say, than in their late teens? And does that matter? A complicated question, Jane. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, Marjorie, what you're asking there. If women have, say, three children, but later in their lives, that does slow population growth but they have to get down to that 2.1 to stop population growth, to reach a stationary population. So that's one part of the question. I think the other part you're asking is, are women still biologically capable of having children um, uh, in their, their late thirties, of having the numbers that they want? And the answer, may, I once wrote a paper, age and fertility, how late can you wait? And it, as it turns out, if you look at the historical record, uh, and here we have Marjorie McIntosh and Myron Gutman, two historians. If you look at the uh, record, say, of England in um, the 17th, 18th century, women had their last child when they were in their 40s, uh, 42 or 43 on average. So there was plenty of time. The great concern about infertility that we see today is real, but it is much greater. It is not as great as, as the concern with it actually is. But that's a topic, a long topic to answer, a long question to answer. 
turn myself back on. So uh, Douglas truly asks about um, pushback in Bangladesh or other countries, possibly from conservative religious forces to Americans. Um, that's not happening in Bangladesh. It's not happening in Iran. Uh, in Iran, fertility plummeted. Um, the very strong uh, Muslim countries of Bangladesh and um, uh, the Middle East reduce their fertility or are reducing their fertility now. And the pushback is much more on women's empowerment than on fertility. That's great. Well, Jane, this has been a fabulous hour. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure I'll turn the word back maybe to, to David to see if he has any last words uh, or to others. Um, but thank you very much for this. Thanks to everyone for being such a great audience. Um, and uh, we look forward to learning more from these great projects. Thanks everybody for uh, participating. I, I personally learned a, a great deal about issues which uh, are important to all societies. And uh, I hope that your, your uh, uh, results and your influence can have some impact in the political world uh, throughout, throughout the nations. Uh, because in, in my view, politicians' primary responsibility is to uh, facilitate the success of their constituents. And if careful planning, family planning leads to greater economic and social success, that would be a, a desirable outcome. So I, I congratulate you on taking up this uh, subject and uh, we're delighted to have you participate in this uh, series of presentations, which by the way, for people listening, will go on and on and on this summer and fall. We have four or five more programs uh, lined up uh, by, uh, to be given by people with the title of distinguished professor. And uh, we're hoping that this will be a continuing learning process for all of us. Thanks very much and have a good evening.